Hi, and welcome to the Data Strategy Gurus podcast once again from ClickWorld here in Las Vegas. Uh, we're joined by Simon Mortimer. He's an assistant director of business information of the South Central Ambulance Services in UK. Hi, uh, Simon. Hello. Welcome. Nice to, meet, nice, nice to meet you. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, you did quite some some trip already with with Click uh, yeah. to enable the yeah. services within yeah. uh, within the South Central yeah. Ambulance Services. Yeah. Can you tell me a bit more about your journey? And yeah, um, I joined the South Central Ambulances, or SCAS as we're known, to make data life simple about eight years ago. And we'd already a, a click shop, we were already adopting it, we'd already had our partnership relationship. But we, I would say it's a very traditional BI solution. We had great dashboards if you're an analyst. They weren't, they weren't any good to the end users who are actually the people we're trying to encourage to make decisions. So we spent a lot of time working with Click and our partner in, in that, about developing solutions which align better with the business. The information literacy stuff we do is very much about in your role, what decisions do you need to make as a manager? Therefore, what information should we give you in the dashboard? You're not an analyst, you're an information manager, you're controlling your processes, you're measuring your quality, you're looking after demand, both in clinical services, yes. you know, and the, we, we, we deliver about 2.6 million clinical contacts a year. Wow. Uh, and it's about one every 12 and a half seconds. I had to get that in because we're, we're a data geek, so you've got to put something <laughs> like that in. Um, but it gives you a context of what we're talking about across three service lines we do, um, but also back office, finance people, HR people. Yes. And uh, we, we're here at ClickWorld, um, thanks to our sponsors and our partners, Differentia and Infinity, who have paid for us to come today. So in the UK, to Max, there's no, no taxpayers' money was spent getting <laughs> us here. Um, and believe me, they're getting value for money out of us being here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, a bit part of it was the information literacy about skill, but also, a, you know, and particularly around management and what's management's role and what do managers do and what information do they need to make the decisions they're meant to be doing. And, you know, it's about aligning that and the information skills. And some of it is very technical, you know, it's about how do you, what's a mean, what's a the statistical process control and stuff. But also the context and the cultural things around Okay, how do you supervise people using information? How do you use yeah. things? A, a really good example of that is we, we get a, a real-time 15-minute data feed from our telephony platform. Mm -hmm. Goes into the data warehouse. We've got a clicks, uh, it's a click view of my great click sense dashboard. And so we spoke to the supervisors and said, well, so what's your reporting? They said, oh, what we want is we want a, a list every morning of all the call takers and all the call takers. I went, you're not having that. That's no use. Yeah, the typical. What, what, what we'll give you is a scatter plot. What's a scatter plot? Um, and we, we, we actually call them smartygrams for people outside the UK, and you can call it an MM gram, little, little coloured blobs. Oh, yeah. So yeah. They, and, and they call it that, and it's one of our engagement things. You, you can call it what you want, it's what you want, that's what we'll call it. But what we started doing is a very simple scatter plot that said number of calls handled, average talk time, and started teaching them about as a supervisor. So, as a supervisor, you want to be looking at the top right hand corner of people because they're the ones handling a lot of calls and taking a long time. The good ones are the ones on the left who are taking a lot of calls. So there's a whole culture of data and information and how you use it to actually drive it. So we're now very much focused on, we build apps and solutions which sort that out. And as you go higher up the organization, we have five levels of organization from supervisors to the board. And we started defining what information sets do those people need. I'm a senior manager. I do BI, but I'm also a senior manager. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. so I'm part of that senior management group as well as being a BI. So at my level, another classic example of what we've done is anybody that's a board level application report, a senior manager application, I have said you will not have any time series data shorter than 30 days. 30 days, 90 days, years later, because you should not be looking at anything under 30 days as a senior manager. It's too tactical. Next level down, you should be looking at that. And then, so that's the sort of thing we try and drive that, align the data and information with the business needs and the yeah, manager yeah, supervisory yeah. leads. Because it's very interesting that, you know, all this fantastic automation, Mike Capone was showing us automation, the yeah. visualization. <laughs> if it's the wrong information, it can be looking as great. It's not going to do its job because you're not, you know, the thing is, what's the question you should be asking in your role? Exactly. So we, we've moved a lot. And talking about the click environment, um, I shared it to somebody the other day. I, I'm not a technologist. I come from the business analytical side, working in loads of different industries. Okay. But I love technology. I came from the airline industry, where you know technology has always been a really huge driver of stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
And people will say, well, what do you notice about the click technology? They say, I don't notice the click technology, which actually is a very positive thing. Because actually, every time we have a challenge, the click technology meets it. I've never had a challenge where they couldn't deliver something, couldn't do something during COVID. You know, they did some yeah. really interesting solutions about how we did that, you know. And the whole, I always say the thing I like about it, and Mike talks about it a lot, and I genuinely believe because I see it, about the community. We've got, we have strategic partners, Differential and Infinity. Yes. They, they, they work with us, it's a partnership. Yes, and that's what I understood as well in my <laughs> communications and, and interviews I had before. Yeah. It's, it's really the collaboration yes. and not yeah. purely selling a product yeah. and features as such. Yeah. Listening to the customers, talking yeah. to the ecosystem yeah. and feeding that back in, yeah. that they build solutions that really help yeah. you on, and, and what your need is. So yeah. that's, that's really intriguing to, yeah. do, to hear that. Yeah, I mean, I'm also a click luminary. And it was interesting because we have a meetup every year in, in, in Sweden and they come and talk to us. You know, James comes to talk to us. And I saw things we said last year in the product demo today. Oh, that's so that, and actually, oh yeah, they are. I remember us asking for that, and it it was things like the fonts and the presentation, which we all nagged them because I know it's not it's not interesting technology, <laughs> but the users go that way. Oh god, I don't like that. Yeah, that stuff makes this life so much easier about engagement. But I genuinely believe, and we're we're a relatively small company. There's no need for Click to do what they do for us. Because actually, we're not a huge company. In, in oh, so you, but you're I, really respected, even I read, that you're I smaller read, cost. Yeah, we've, we, we've got 600 licenses, which isn't huge in the great scheme of things. It's not small, mm -hmm. but it's not. Yeah. But you know, they, I, you know, I can. It's and it's not. It, it is that I can physically demonstrate behaviours which have supported me deliver our patient care through analytics and the culture and the values that they recognise we do. And you know, as somebody in my role, that's most probably more important than technology because I'm the head. I'm the director of the service. Yeah, so actually, I'm, I'm looking at efficiency and quality and relationships. I've got mm -hmm. people who are really good at this stuff who understand it. And they trust it as well, you know. And I think part of why we're here today is a bit of payback for that. You know, we've been, it's about a private public partnership. So we're here talking. Yes. And yeah, you know, I would not say anything I didn't believe. I would not sit here as a senior manager in the NHS and say, and say something I didn't believe it. And I strongly believe this is a fantastic, and this is day to day helping us deliver solutions so our managers can make decisions and our clinicians can make decisions, which is enhancing patient care. Some of it is, is very, very bog standard process optimization, looking at our processes, how to become more efficient so we've got more resources to deliver. It makes sense completely. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and which is, you know, one of the other things I said this morning is having worked across multiple industries, there is no secret such as an industry paradigm in management. Manager is a manager, a leader is a leader, and a super, in every industry, it's that last 10%. When yes, you contextualize uh, uh, it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You don't have to convince me. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's that's how I look at things. Yeah. Typically, uh, I'm yeah. working very often as a freelance consultant, and then they say, "Where is your expertise in, in yeah. which industry?" Yeah. I say, "I don't want. I want to be industry agnostic." Yeah, yeah. And that's an advantage yeah. because I do understand financials. I do understand marketing yeah. and all these processes. Yeah. And that's the added value where you think yeah. across all departments yeah. and, and try to yeah. break that down. Yeah, I've got a, a, a good couple of really classic examples about how that is right. I used to work for the airline industry, mm -hmm. and we all know that airlines overbook flights. They look at a probability of somebody not showing. Yes. Um, I went to work for a big teaching hospital in, in London, and we started looking at outpatient appointments and people who didn't show up for outpatient appointments. Now, the management methodology we used was exactly the same. You know, What's the Bayesian probability of this person? You know, it's a 0.8, therefore all overbooked by 20%. So the model mm -hmm. of how we then did that with outpatients and what we understood that is we understand the features, you know, what specialities or how age they were. But it's then, that, okay, what do you do with that? Because that's where you get into the industry context about how you do it. And the other interesting thing, you know, we do a lot of process optimization and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we look at our task time. And that's, that's process optimization. How fast are we doing? What are the components of the process? Is it changing? Is it moving? What's driving that change? And what's driving that thing? That's just process optimization. That, that is no different from any other organization would do. What you take with that information, and you know, there, there's a very interesting example. We had that around task time and how that was changing, how we broke it down to understand the business. And yes. the initial reaction was, oh, my, what's happening? But we broke it down and actually drove some really interesting strategic decision-making around that. Um, and, you know, if you're a manager or a supervisor, you know, you're a manager, it's about demand. What's my demand? What's my quality? What's my resource needs? How do I motivate my staff? How do I build relationships? Yes. And, you know, that, that is the same because in the end, there's one thing about organizations, they're full of these things called people. They sometimes tend to forget. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and we're all human beings, and we all emotionally react in the same way. And it, it, and it, it's part of it. I was saying about. I, I'm very lucky with my team. I'm very proud of them. I, I've handed a really good 
pack of cards when I joined the organisation. I've got business analysts, proper business analysts, oh, proper, yeah. um, who understand <laughs> relationships. Because you know, if you look at our, our 999 response, which is emergency response, we have seven operational nodes. Each of them has an area manager. They've all got the same problems. They're all different people. Yes. And to be effective BI, the person that looks off has to know those people. Because they're all going to ask the same question, but how they engage with them, how they listen, how they use those mm-hmm. dashboards and information. You know, if I'm, if, I'm, if I'm going to go and talk to one of them, I'll say to my colleague, okay, I'm going to go and talk to X. How do I talk to them? How do they react? Are they a so data you're, advocate? You're really t- well, you're really taking care of, of how you communicate yes. in the soft skills. Build, build, you've got to, it's interesting. I think the future... The, If you want to be successful in BI going forward, you've got to develop your communication and your relationship skills with your customers. Because actually, I keep on coming back to this question, you know, people, we get obsessed with the technology bit in the middle. Um, Very often. We get myopic about it. What we forget is you still got to ask the right question and you still got to be able to interpret the answer effectively. And that's about your business context. It's about the culture, you know, how you might tell, you know, some some of our staff, we can be very... Bum, 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 some of them you need a bit softer. Same thing. We've we've just done a very interesting work around. We've got an online dashboard for uh, our staff, staff in post. Yes. Um, you get a file every night from our HR system. Who's in post? When do they start? Um, the thing that's delayed that isn't the technology. It isn't the information. It is part of what I do is data and information standards as well. What's an employee? Or what do you mean? When you say employees. What do you mean by an employee? What's the whole time equivalent? What do you mean by attrition? I mean, that's that process of definition, which is incredibly important. It's not a bureaucratic exercise. It's getting people and managing, how are you going to run your business? How are you going to manage it? Another classic is that we had sickness. There's, there's four ways we measure sickness. There's a national standard, which is okay. Yes. But, you know, yeah. then we have to, but I had my, my, my colleague who does all the planning and forecasting demand. It's yeah. got to be whole time. I don't care how many people, it's got to be whole time equivalent. It's about how many, how many whole time equivalents I'm losing. The HR manager goes, no, it's got to be about head count. It must be about head count. I went, okay, uh, yeah, you're actually it's both good. right. And do you know, because actually you're interested in how much capacity are you doing to deliver. You're interested in the HR aspects about how oh, we've got a lot of staff going off sick for some reason. You're both right. And do you know the beauty of technology? We built it, we've got a little button that goes, whole time equivalent, head count. Whole time equivalent, and Head you have cam. a transformation yeah. rule between. Yeah, both. it just yeah. switches it. You know, it's you know, it's sickness loss. If it's a thirty-seven and a half hour week, that gives you whole time equivalent, or it's unique by your your staff number to give you your headcount. Yeah, so you gave the same t- same type of information, yeah. but then the context what they want. Yeah, because they're, they're both right. It's not an either or. You, and actually, I say part of my job around data and information standards is BI's team are respons- we're responsible for doing that process. I said, yes. my job is to facilitate the fight. <laughs> you know, and, and actually, well, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but actually, when you come up with something, make sure it's not too out there. So, but you know, in the end, that, that that's my job is to say you must have a standard. It must be relevant. I'm not the HR expert. I'm not the planning expert. I'm not the finance expert. No, my job is to say you have a standard which we have all signed off. And that's yes. where BI comes in. That's the other. It's the secondary non-technology elements around BI. And so you, yeah, and and how was that journey trying to get to those standards? Because I've been involved in a lot of these discussions, yeah. and it's pretty hard. To sign off even uh, even after a year, um, uh, many discussions, oh yeah. uh, uh, a lot of people around the table. But it's hard to get that get definition done. crystal clear yeah. and in the context that they want yeah. to use it. Um, we have a data and information quality policy, and you're going to go, oh yeah. But there's a very interesting section called 3.21 in there, which says if you don't get if you don't agree, Simon can override you all and sign it off arbitrarily. Because he's head of data and information quality. So somebody really can say, okay, yeah, this me, is the I can, yeah, yeah. I, I've got to go through a process of facilitating conversation. The and enough, really, that's yeah, it. Here's my decision. Move on. I'm empowered by the organization to say, if mm-hmm. people can't come together, because that, you know, that, that's the ultimate thing. Okay, Simon makes a decision. He's, he's got the ultimate authority in the organization to make the decision if you can't decide. Yeah, that's a good one. You really got a mandate to... Yeah, really and I, we're doing that with some of the HR stuff. We said, right, enough, we had a discussion. I'm going to write the definitions off. I'm going to the exec. We'll sign them off. I'm implementing the policy because you, you know... So, so you've been yeah. pretty successful in, in, in that. Yeah, area. I think I, I, the, the thing that's good about it is it stimulates a discussion around the business. It's not about an arcane discussion about that. It's actually, you know, this HR was a classic example about where you were both right and we can do both for you. So let's not get hung up on it. Stop having a conflict because actually you're both right. <laughs> yes, it's not, I'm right, you're right. No, yeah. no, no. no, no. You're both right, we can do that. This mm-hmm. is a classic one. When you get into things that are talking about the same thing, that, that, that's but in the end, also the policy also says that 
the domain expert in that area has the authority. So it's an HR type question. We have a person in HR who's the guru, and actually, yes. in the end, he can make the decision, or she, and then fire that. So you have a debate, and you engage with people. But in the end, and if you can't, then it comes to me, and I go, right, that's what we're doing. Yeah. So at the South Central uh, Ambulance that's Services, you're using yeah. a lot of real-time data. Yeah. Yeah. So um, where do you get the data from? Is that right. sensors, uh, or what, 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 what type of real-time? So the real, I mean, real... Always interesting, you know, real time. What does that mean? Uh, yeah, real time. So we, we basically have seven tri- prime, four primary transactional systems and three secondary transactional systems. So we have a dispatch system which actually dispatches the vehicle. Yes. Um, that's linked into the vehicle. We have um, real high time availability data at the vehicle. Um, we have an electronic patient record system which is the clinical. So you come to you, we'll record the clinical, all your vital signs and what was wrong with you. That's for 999. We also have in 111, which is a call service, we've got a call platform, so telephony plus a, a process system, which we get up, yeah. So for thing and our patient transport, again, we have a dispatch system which manages the booking. So most of those are on, the CAD system's on a 15 minute feed. So every 15 minutes we get a feed because we don't do transactional operational BI. That should always come out of your transactional system. You know, that what's happening now, the mm-hmm. last five minutes. We always say about 15 minutes is, is our sort of where we get involved. It's management and supervision information, not tactical operational. But, you know, we say EPR data we get overnight because there's no point in having it any faster because there's nothing strategically you're going to do with clinical data fast. So yeah. you need it once a month, okay. that's fine. Yeah. The other systems, we get about an hour to an hour, we get a data feed from it. So we do that. We develop it into our dashboards. Again, that's a very interesting thing about who you give the information to and what do you show so they're not sitting there going, oh, it's all gone bad. So it's very good data quality. We have a lot of, like, the, the, the if you take a 999 call in the UK, you phone on your mobile phone, we automatically know where you are in about 10 seconds down to a meter because we'll get sent your geolocation on the mobile phone. That will automatically pick up your location. Um, all the processes are virtual, it's all automatic. So a lot of it is, for instance, we have our category one calls, which we have to respond to from present it, switchboard to respond on an average of seven minutes. Wow. So we have all the data stamped, it's all automatic. Where's the vehicle? We track the vehicle. You know, we get a, we get a status um, for about every five seconds when it's on blue lights, about every minute when it's just monitoring around. So, you know, we do things like auto dispatch. So when you call us, we know where you are, we know where the vehicles are. If you're within about a 10 kilometer circle, we'll try and dispatch you automatically. Yeah. Okay. So it's very data orientated. It's very processed. We're very, one of the benefits we do have is there's very little manual data capture. It's automated or button pressing. Yeah. And we've got, you know, really simple, we, yeah, yeah. and it, you know, it's very good. And actually, you know, we feed that into you know, loads of different applications, and that's where you get the data and information. It's the same data, but it's presented and you turn it information in the context of the decision you're making. You know, I do duty commander every every five days, and our most simplest dashboard is one that shows us hospital queues. You know, it's really and people use it because actually they're sitting there. I watch it and I go, okay, that's going to be a problem today. That's going to be a problem today. And that's real time every 15 minutes showing oh, us. It's really vehicles nice away. that you have these type of insights. Yeah, yeah, yes. yeah. So that's very interesting. That's a very classical example of augmented intelligence. Yes. Because you've got a list of hospitals and, you know, I, you could immediately go, right, who's queuing the most? Which hospitals queue? So, you know, we're meant to hand over in 15 minutes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there are certain hospitals we know have always got a problem. They're always going to have a delay. We'll put extra resources in there. <laughs> and I was saying to the colleague who comes from our area, I said, your hospital is a very, very good hospital. If I start getting queuing there, the whole county is in trouble because if you're falling down, even though it may not be a large number, and that's my, in my mind, that's a classic example of how you bring your knowledge to an operational situation and actually react to it appropriately. Yeah. And if I see that and I'm on call, I go, oh, it's going to be a long night. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, it's going to be a lot of phone calls. Um, yeah. Yes. But yeah, uh, so we're very lucky. I mean, I've worked in, you know, all industries, hospitals far more complex. And they go, oh, it's too complex. And I say, yeah, but a lot of this is around culture and behavior. If you want to make this stuff work, you can make it work. Exactly. And it's your behaviors and the culture and integration into it is the key thing. If if the people around the exec table want to work, work it will work. If they don't, it won't. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's a real nice takeaway. Yeah. And, I, and I feel that I can travel safe to UK, especially yeah. if I need to be uh, picked up by the ambulance yeah. services. Yeah. Hospital is still a different thing, yeah. if I understood, of yeah. your dashboards. Yeah. So, uh, okay, very, yeah. very, very yeah. nice. So, I have a, lo- uh, a last question. Yeah. I always say data connects us all. 
yeah. but music connections as well. Yeah. So what is your favorite type of music or band? Oh dear, you, you, you've, that's a really difficult question because I am very, I, I, I'm very hedonist, I'm very difficult. I'd actually like loads of different music. So if you were to say, what's the genre I like most? Um, I, I would say it's what they call folk punk in Britain. So it's not like folk music, but it's actually, uh, if, yes. uh, if, if you want some bands to go and listen to, uh, a band called Ferocious Dog, who are brilliant. Okay. Uh, um, uh, Frank Turner is a musician, and I happen to know him because his mum lives three doors down from me. So Frank <laughs> Turner, go and buy his because then it keeps his mum happy. Um, the Ferocious Dog, um, things like that. Um, I've got a very eclectic mix. Uh, the Day Line's another good band. Um, You know, I was, I was a bit of a political radical when I was young, so I like those that sort of music. Yes. But my wife, bless her, who I've been with for 36 years, is on an ongoing mission to drive some culture into my head. So we go to the opera a lot and <laughs> classical music. I, I I don't know how she's kept going for 36 years, bless her. But you know, you know. But yeah, I, 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 as you grow older, you, you know, we love going to the uh, Met Opera live. You know, the Met Opera in New York. They do live broadcasts in the UK. And we love going to those mm -hmm. and stuff like that. So yeah, very eclectic mix of music. So it's a very difficult question for me to answer. I, my boss was in the car the other day we were driving and I had one of these sort of funk pope bands on she said that is the last sort of music I thought you would ever listen to and she was quite surprised actually she said yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's nice to hear that you yeah. have these different type of music and, yeah. and like you say I wouldn't expect you to listen to folk punk or, or yeah. something uh, like that yeah. so well I would you know I was you know I was very lucky that you know I grew up in Britain in the late 70s and the early 80s that was my sort of so you had the punk you had the new romantic you had the new wave I oh, particularly yeah, yeah. like um, ska music like you know second generation like the Caribbean ska but also things like Two Tone Mad and Selector yes. and people like that. So yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, Simon, it was very nice talking to you. Good. Thanks for your time. All right.